we were not told about Rodney King being hit 56 times in 81 seconds with batons. We saw it with our own eyes. It was on video. So we saw four police beating Rodney King. It was clear cut. 56 times in 81 seconds. Something like this. Boom. Pow. 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 That was New Jersey Senator Bill Bradley in 1992. And I will never forget that day in the Senate as we all watched when Bill Bradley made that impromptu decision on the Senate floor to hit his podium 56 times in 81 seconds to drive home to the United States Senate what everyone in America had seen in the video of Rodney King being almost beaten to death by Los Angeles police officers in 1991. The Senate chamber got quieter and quieter with each tap of Bill Bradley's pencil. He did it 56 times in 81 seconds. And we know about those 56 times in 81 seconds because a 30-year-old plumber named George Holliday reached for his new Sony video camera when he heard police sirens in a helicopter in the middle of the night. He told the Los Angeles Times, quote, you know how it is when you have a new piece of technology, you film anything and everything. George Holliday stepped onto his balcony of his apartment and he aimed his camera at what the L.A. police officers were doing to a black man lying on the pavement. That video soon became the lead story on every newscast in America and then every newscast in the world. George Holliday's video gave white America their first real look at how policing works in black America. Last weekend, after being hospitalized with coronavirus for about a month in Simi Valley, California, George Holliday died at age 61. Last year, George Holliday hoped to buy a home by auctioning off the video camera he used to make history. He said he was hoping to, quote, inspire people to use their cameras for everything, the bad and the good. When there were no bidders for his camera, George Holliday told The Sun, quote, I've been a plumber for 43 years. It looks like I'm going to have to be a plumber for quite a few more years. In 1993, Reverend Jesse Jackson said this about George Holliday. What was missed by and large in news commentary was that the only reason that we know anything about Rodney King is a white man named George Halliday filmed the beating and took it public. Had George Halliday not had the quickness of thought and the character to take the film public, he would never have known of, of a rotten cane. In other words, George Halliday went beyond color, went beyond race, up to the high plateau of, of courage with character to make America better and true to its, true to its commitment. Reverend Jesse Jackson gets tonight's last word about George Holliday. Is this bill paid for in a way that satisfies you? Do you consider this bill paid for? Well, so I think we have a big chunk of it paid for. I think there is more that we could do to raise revenue. And so I think if that is the concern that's holding some people back, I think they need to know that a lot of us who you know support this bill are also willing to pay for it. And a big chunk of it is paid for. We've worked very, very hard in the House to identify ways to raise revenue by eliminating special interest loopholes in our tax code, by coming up with a more fair system of global tax enforcement um, that is, you know, fair for the for U.S. companies and foreign companies. So we can pay for as much of this as we want to. Um, and I stand ready and willing to do that. I think there are some big pieces, including lowering the price of prescription drugs, which is not only good policy, but would also help us pay for the investment in health care, including providing dental health dental, hearing, and vision for Medicare beneficiaries, lowering the age of Medicare eligibility to 60, 
I think we need to put that piece back in the bill to lower the price of prescription drugs, both because we ran on it, because it's good policy, because it's a real problem for the American people, and because it would help us pay for the changes and improvements to health care that we want to make. Uh, you run and, and run for election in Orange County. You converted a Republican seat to a Democratic seat. You obviously know how to talk to Republican voters, and you, you know how to deal with that dynamic in your district, which not all Democrats do. Uh, they don't all have mixed districts the way you do. Uh, so you also strike me as someone who knows how to talk to the people that are being now labeled moderates in the House who feel like they want to go slower on the reconciliation side, go smaller on the reconciliation side. How, do, how does your dialogue go with those people? Well, I think with the question to put to these conservative Democrats, and I've had some of these conversations, including tonight, is what do you want to cut? Tell me, do your constituents not have trouble paying for childcare? Are your constituents not worried about climate change? Are your constituents not in need of roads and bridges? Do your constituents not struggle to pay for the price of prescription drugs? It, the answer always is yes, of course. Then, then the answer is clear. Then you should support these things. Which, when you ask them, when you really put the, to these conservative Democrats, do you not think these things are problems? Do you not hear from your constituents that this is the agenda that they want, that they support the president's agenda? They often are speechless. They, they know it's true. They know this is what their constituents need. They simply have very vague objections, often based on some sense of what is and isn't possible. But I want to be clear, Lawrence, the people of this country elected each one of us, Democrat or Republican, to make better policy in their lives possible. It's up to us. What is possible is defined by what we're willing to do to deliver for the families who sent us to Washington. The, I just want to go inside these conversations for a moment for the audience, because I think the way you just described them sounds kind of confrontational and, frankly, more confrontational than what I was used to when I was working there when I saw people trying to pull people in their direction. How would you describe them in terms of uh, confrontational or cooperative or supportive? Are you trying to support someone to find his way or her way to voting the way you want them to vote? I, 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 don't, I don't think it, people in the audience really have a feel for how these conversations go. Oh, no, they're very, very pleasant. I mean, I had a, a terrific conversation tonight um, with one of the conservative Demo uh, Democrats um, who signed the, the letter to the speaker about the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I said, you know, I really support the bipartisan infrastructure bill. I cannot wait to vote to deliver infrastructure to the American people. And he said, I'm so happy to hear that. And I said, can I count on you to vote to deliver help with health care, with senior care, with child care, um, with climate change, with you know, college costs. Can I count on you to help deliver those things to the American people, too? So and, and the answer was, uh, uh, uh. And so I, I think that is a, a very positive way to say the conversation is we are all in for doing infrastructure. That is what the Progressive Caucus has said from the very beginning. We support investment in infrastructure. It's not the only thing we support. We also support the other needs of the American people. And one way to understand this is those infrastructure jobs, the, the data tells us that about 90 percent of those infrastructure jobs will go to men. And yet I was elected by both men and women. I was elected to think about the entire workforce, not just one sector or one sex. I was elected to create jobs across our economy. So that means I need to be thinking about other kinds of investments beyond infrastructure. So it's yes to infrastructure. It's yes to child care. It's yes to senior care. It's yes to climate change, because all of these things will grow our economy. That's the litmus test. And so when you ask these members these questions, I think it's really helpful. Um, they're very positive conversations, I think, to, to try to prompt them to really understand why don't you want to grow our economy? And when you put it that way, I think the answer often is, hmm, hmm, I'm not sure. And that's exactly where they should be, is thinking about it. Lauren, I wanted to have you on tonight because I knew Brad Raffensperger was going to be on with uh, Chris Hayes uh, at, at 8 o'clock, as he was. And I want to get your reaction to what you heard from the Secretary of State earlier tonight. Well, I think it's quite interesting, Lawrence, that uh, our Secretary of State finds himself on MSNBC tonight to sell a book to liberals really looking for an answer in the Republican Party on their authoritarian march. But we got a larger problem here with Raffensperger. 
and it goes to kind of the larger problem Republicans have in Georgia and elsewhere, is that they have been playing with fomenting and encouraging this voter fraud narrative and disinformation the entire time. So though I and many others are glad that the Secretary of State did the right thing, the election is over. Joe Biden won. We checked the vote multiple times. We had a runoff. John Ossoff, Raphael Warnock won, despite their best efforts. And the problem we're seeing here in Georgia is that while Fannie Willis, our excellent district attorney, goes after uh, this massive crime that was attempted here in Georgia, at the same time, we're seeing Raffensperger and his Republican allies use anti-democratic election subversion provisions in the bill they championed earlier this year to try and take over the biggest Democratic, most African-American county in the state. In fact, just last week, Brad Raffensperger was threatening the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, this is our largest county in the state, and saying if they did not appoint somebody he liked for the Fulton County Board of Elections, that he would, quote, take them over. There are 20 bills, Lawrence, that have passed in 13 states around the country, including Georgia, that are meant to take power away from elections officials and move it to gerrymandered Republican state legislatures and other unelected political bodies because they have taken the big lie. They have taken the drop boxes and early vote and vote by mail that everybody used in a pandemic at new levels. And they are weaponizing all those voter fraud lies to restrict all of that access and shift election, of power, election power away. And so if Brad Raffensperger thinks integrity counts, he needs to not try and take over a local county that had the best early vote, the most drop boxes in the state, and focus on cleaning up his Republican Party that is so disinformation addled that they're appealing to the MAGA nuts at all, at all costs. It's it's really not okay. So don't buy his book is what I would say. Don't spend your money on Brad Raffensperger's book. Go to StopJimCrow2.com and we got to get the Freedom to Vote Act passed. I, I was struck by one exchange uh, that Chris had with him where he was asking him about mail-in voting and why you would make changes to mail-in voting. And he absolutely never answered the question. It's not worth showing the video of it because he just wandered off on, on without ever coming back to and referring in any way to why you would make changes to mail-in voting after mail-in voting was so successful in Georgia. Well, and I think you just nailed it. And I thought Chris did a really great job in that interview. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Rudy Giuliani and the Republican leadership of the state of Georgia invited Rudy Giuliani down for two different voter fraud, quote unquote, election integrity hearings in December in this state, weeks before the election. And then their ally, True the Vote, tried to kick 360,000 Georgians off the rolls two weeks before the election. And what's a problematic thing here about Raffensperger lying around integrity, all of the voter fraud lies that Giuliani and the Republicans spewed in these December hero hearings that caused elections officials to get threatened, that caused state legislatures legislators to get threatened, all of those lies got transmitted into this massive bill in Georgia and then copycatted in Arizona, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, Arkansas, Ohio. And it all goes back to the big lie. So if Brad Raffensperger and others Republicans want to, you know, fight disinformation, they need to fight their own party and not pander to this MAGA faction and tell them the truth.